Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Do you have someone you love who has experienced a heart attack? I can definitely tell you that I have. And I remember uh, the shock on their face as they realized what had just happened. Even more shocking is the prospect of having open heart surgery and the ideal of rerouting those clogged arteries, which led to the heart attack in the first place. Now, let's imagine for a moment, um, imagine a world where very few people have heart disease because they've discovered a new way, a way to prevent heart disease by simply making lifestyle changes that keep it from ever occurring. And imagine even more having the very same physicians who do heart surgery, who instead of signing more patients up for surgery, instead they teach them how to stay off their operating table by teaching the principles of achieving metabolic health. Well, I have some good news. There's no need to imagine anymore because today's guest is leading his surgery colleagues and all of us as he teaches the healing principles of metabolic health. Today's guest is Dr. Philip Avadia, who is a board-certified cardiac surgeon and founder of Ovadia Heart Health. His mission is to optimize the public's metabolic health and help people stay off his operating table. As a heart surgeon who used to be morbidly obese, Dr. Avadia has seen firsthand the failures of mainstream diets and medicine. He realized that what helped him lose over 100 pounds was the same solution that could have prevented most of the thousands of open heart surgeries he has performed, and that's by achieving metabolic health. In his book, Stay Off My Operating Table, A Heart Surgeon's Metabolic Health Guide to Lose Weight, Prevent Disease, and Feel Your Very Best Every Day, he shares the complete metabolic health system to prevent disease. He grew up in New York and graduated from the Accelerated Pre-Med and Med Program at the Pennsylvania State University and Jefferson Medical College. This was followed by a residency in general surgery at the University of Medicine and Dentistry at New Jersey and a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Tufts New England Medical School. And with that, Doc, I welcome you to Protecting Your Nest. Thank you, Tony. It's great to be here. I've been a fan of your show and of your messaging for quite a while now, and I love uh, you know the efforts that you're putting out there to help people get healthy. I appreciate that, and uh, obviously we have a similar uh, purpose, a similar focus, and I really love the fact that you have discovered metabolic health. I, I do want to apologize. I know you said you've been traveling and you're in a cold place. You're normally in a warm place. So in Chicago, it's uh, really like zero degrees. So we're both kind of trying to stay indoors and warm. So I appreciate your sacrifices as you, again, share your message of healing. But let's get the party started. I know that you've been out sharing uh, the work you've just created in your book. And I think I want to make sure that everybody listening understands your journey as well. And you've had some physical challenges. I mentioned that you lost over 100 pounds uh, and you figured out this metabolic health uh, way of healing. So talk a little bit about your journey so our listeners will have an idea of how you got to where you are today. Sure thing. So, you know, my background, I was uh, obese as a child, um, you know, and that was despite the fact that I grew up in a family that really followed all of the guidelines, all of the recommendations. Uh, I have a a brother, an older brother, who's a type one diabetic. So we had literally no sugar in the house. Uh, We ate, you know, low fat, uh, you know, according to the food guidelines, we ate all of our, uh, you know, heart healthy grains and the Cheerios and the Wheaties for cereal for breakfast with uh, skim milk and margarine instead of butter. And despite that, you know, I was always overweight. Um, and that problem got worse as I, you know, went through high school and then medical school and and surgical training, you know, you know how stressful all of that is and, uh, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, uh, eating, eating a lot of food in the hospital a lot of the time, which, uh, says something. And, uh, you know, a number of times along the way, I realized that, you know, being overweight wasn't healthy and I 
tried to lose weight and I did what I was taught in school, eat less, move more, right. eat a low fat diet, track your calories. And like many people, you know, it works in the short term and I would lose some weight, but then I would end up gaining back the weight and more. Uh, and, you know, about six years ago, I really found myself at a loss. I was morbidly obese by that time. I was pre-diabetic and I realized that I was going to end up on my own operating table, mm -hmm. so to speak. And thankfully, I started to come across some, you know, different ideas around obesity and health. Um, I uh, was fortunate to hear a lecture by Gary Tobbs at one of the medical meetings that I was attending. And uh, he had just written the case against sugar. And of course, prior to that, had written uh, why we get fat and good calories, bad calories. And, you know, what Gary talked about, that the types of food that we eat are more important than the amount of food that we eat mm -hmm. uh, really made sense. And I, you know, read all his books and I started eliminating sugar and ultimately, you know, got into, you know, low carb uh, keto, you know, type uh, lifestyle and uh, finally ended up with uh, carnivore, which is basically what I have done for the past three years. Uh, but during that time, I've lost over 100 pounds. I've been able to maintain the weight loss for the first time in my life. And I had my eyes open to the importance of metabolic health. And when I started to look at the patients that I was operating on every day with heart disease, what I realized is that they were universally metabolically unhealthy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, started looking into that more and realized the importance of metabolic health, not only to preventing heart disease, but really most of the chronic diseases that plague our society today. And I just, you know, realized that I had to refocus my mission uh, to help people to stay off my operating table. And so that's what led to the book and uh, everything that I'm doing today. That's, that's, you know, every time I hear uh, Gary Tobb's name, uh, and then of course I think about Nina Taisho's, I am, I, I just, it seems like a guy like you and me would have led this, uh, this revolution uh, towards understanding metabolic health, but it took the work of two journalists who have really not only impacted our lives personally, but I would argue will go down legend as legends uh, because they opened our eyes and all the patients, I had a couple of success stories today. One patient who I had in in some ways given up on, and she knows it if she, she hears this episode, because I just think that she, in, in that November, she was probably, I don't know, 35 pounds heavier than she is today. Her A1C was nine back then, now it's six. And I, you know, so you never give up on people and you always encourage them, but it does take the knowledge that Gary and Nina Taishos gave us. And so I really appreciate the work they've done. And so thankful that you kind of ran across that work, but you are a surgeon and you've been trained to fix things. I'm sure even as a, a family doctor, I did do some training in uh, obstetrics and I actually was doing C-sections and tubules. And what I remember from that is it was kind of cool to be able to, you know, fix things, you know, and, 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 and get results right away. But I, 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 t I did a little bit of a Google search as I prepared for our conversation. And I said, well, what does it cost to have heart surgery? And the numbers that I saw, it was a big range. It was anywhere from on the low end, 30,000, on the high end, 200,000. And heart transplants are in the 800,000 range. And in other countries like the Netherlands, it was like 15,000. In Argentina, it was 16, but it's a lot of money. And so... I'm curious from your perspective, first of all, how do you uh, continue to pay your bills by keeping people off your operating table and, uh, and, and, just your, and just a little bit about what it's like to have heart surgery? I think people need to be reminded. I think back on that family member I mentioned in the intro, and it was pretty, it's an ugly process in some ways because compared to lifestyle. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, one, one thing just to clarify, all those numbers you threw around about the cost of heart surgery, most of that money doesn't go to the heart <laughs> yes, surgeons. Right. It goes to the hospitals and the and everything that goes involved. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel blessed to be a heart surgeon, you know, to be able to offer that service to the people that need it. Um, but what I've come to realize is that no matter how good a surgeon I am, no matter how good all the other heart surgeons out there are, we can never make the patient 
as good as they would have been if they didn't need the heart surgery in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, the process of going through heart surgery, like you said, is uh, it's it's big. It's a hard surgery for people to get through. It's a hard surgery for people to recover from. Um, and in the end, you know, we haven't changed what led to them needing the heart surgery in the first place. Right. We've only put a Band-Aid on the problem and we've gotten, you know, in, in the case of the most common surgery we do, coronary artery bypass surgery, mm -hmm. you know, we've gotten better blood flow going to different areas of the heart, but we haven't changed the fact that whatever it was in the first place that led to the patient developing those blockages. And, you know, again, that's what I've come to realize that there is so much more power in that that if we can prevent people from needing heart surgery in the first place, they're going to be much better off. And quite frankly, our healthcare system is going to be better mm -hmm. off because mm -hmm. as you know, you know, our healthcare system is overwhelmed by taking care of sick people just at the baseline, you know, and then if you start adding something like a, a pandemic on top of it, you know, it's really stretched to the limits. And the answer is we need to get less people less sick so that you know we have time to deal with the people who are sick and we've greatly improved the lives of w those that never get sick in the first place i love it and what's what's interesting i definitely want to confirm uh as a person who's done c-sections and tubules he's right you get a fraction <laughs> of that uh compensation it mostly goes to the hospital and all these other uh fees that come along with it so so that's absolutely true. And and I am uh, also curious about, uh, you know, I, it sounds like your your dietary approach has clearly shifted towards keto, carnivore. That's pretty much where I'm living, uh, kind of a mostly keto and many days. Uh, it's, and when I have lunch today, it'll, it'll just be animal uh, that I'll be eating. But, um, but, but a lot of people, um, are going to hear this message and, you know, they're, they're going to be curious, you know, what, what, you know, they're already, you know, trying to figure out what metabolic health is. We're trying to socialize that term. So, uh, so I guess part of what I want to ask, and I know that only a 12% of the U S population is metabolically healthy. Um, you know, if, uh, if a patient wants to, to figure out if they're metabolically healthy and their doctors never use that type of language, what would they uh, ask their doctor to look for? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, the first concept there is, you know, what, what does it mean to be metabolically healthy? And at a basic level, you know, what I tell people that means is that your body is utilizing the inputs that you are giving it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is mostly the food that we eat and it's doing, you know, what it's supposed to do with that. And that means that it's converting some of it to energy to use immediately it's using it to build and rebuild our tissues. And then it's storing a little bit of that energy in case there isn't food available, isn't uh, you know energy available at some point. Uh, but when we become metabolically unhealthy, and as you said, 88% of the adults in the United States today are metabolically unhealthy. When we become metabolically unhealthy, we end up storing too much energy essentially, and that leads to a lot of problems, you know, down the line uh, in the body. Um, the best way to assess it, I tell people there were five basic measures, and these are five measurements that everyone needs to know. Uh, their doctors should be checking this on them, and they need to know where they stand on these five measurements. The first one is your waist circumference. Uh, so, you know, you can measure this at home. You just take a tape measure just above the level of your belly button best to measure it first thing in the morning. And if you're a man, you want that to be less than 40 inches. If you're a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches. The next is your blood pressure. Again, measure it at home, go to the grocery store and get it measured at one of the kiosks, or you know, your doctor checks this every time you go to see them. And you want it to be less than 130 over 85 without using any medications. And then we look at some basic blood work. And again, you know, this is blood work that most people get checked. It's just that the doctors aren't looking at it, you know, in the right way. Uh, so you want to look at your fasting blood glucose, the amount of sugar that's in your blood when you haven't eaten for, you know, 8 to 12 hours, 
and you want that to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And then we look at two of your cholesterol numbers. Uh, and this is what you know confuses a lot of patients mm -hmm. and a lot of doctors because we don't look at the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, which is all that everyone talks about. We look at the other cholesterol numbers, the HDL cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, and you want that to be higher. So if you're a man, you want that to be over 40. If you're a woman, you want it to be over 50. And then finally, we look at the triglyceride level, and we want that to be less than 150. And those are the basic measures of metabolic health. Um, there are a lot more complex things we can look at. You can go a lot more in depth th than that, and I mm -hmm. certainly do with my patients. But at least if everyone knew those five metrics, mm -hmm. paid attention to them, and started to find ways to improve them, we would be in a lot better place than we are today as a society. Yeah, and um, the predictive uh, value of an LDL for heart disease is certainly not as uh, good as the predictive value of understanding metabolic disease, insulin resistance, and 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 I even even as I think about your comments, I think about the fact that we still don't have waist circumference as a standard thing that we do in clinic. I mean, you have docs like yourself and myself who are thinking about it, and we may do it because we're thinking about it, but the average you know, chart does not automatically ask the room, you know, the medical assistants to even do that. Uh, so, so that tells you how far disconnected we are. And I, I just want everybody listening to know that your doctor is smart. Your doctor cares about you. Your doctor uh, wants to do what's best for you. But the training they've had uh, did not allow for them to see uh, this way of thinking. And we, we both had to kind of find our own way. We had to do a little bit of that extra work. I'm, I'm getting a master's in nutrition right now. And it's like, man, my eyes are just opening wider and wider. So I think anybody listening uh, understand that it's the training. It's not a doctor who's uh, not caring or an advanced practice clinician who's not caring. And as we think about your book, uh, part two of your book, uh, talks a little bit about some principles. Uh, because once you understand what metabolic health is, you know, you want to understand some basic principles uh, that will help us be successful. So, and one of those principles you talk about is eating whole foods. So talk a little bit about what you mean by whole foods. Yeah. So I think this is, you know, kind of the most important concept when you're trying to figure out how to improve and optimize your metabolic health. And that is to just eat whole real food. And the simple definition I use for that is to eat the things that grow in the ground and then eat the things that eat the things that grow in the ground. Um, so, you know, you're going to have your plant products, you're going to have your animal products. And as you know, you know, there's a lot of debate that goes on in the nutritional world about the balance between those two. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have the vegans, you have the carnivores and you have everything in between. And, you know, I think ultimately all of those can work and do work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I go through in the book, I literally talk about both the vegan and the carnivore diet and lots of things in between keto and, you know, Atkins and Mediterranean. And I point out what is metabolically healthy about each of them and what is not metabolically healthy about each of them. And in the end, you know, when you look at all of these, you know, studies on diets and all of these different camps around diets, you know, the most consistent thing is the more you eliminate processed food, the more you eat whole real food, the healthier you're going to be. Mm, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I have to tell a local pastor that they have competition because I like the messaging. And, and I think this is so critical. One of the things I was concerned about when I became part of this low carb community was to get indoctrinated into a way of thinking that was narrow-minded and didn't really allow me to see the forest for the trees. So that when I interacted with maybe a vegan patient or a vegan colleague, I wouldn't be able to hear them because you're indoctrinated into that way of thinking. A better way of thinking, which is why the term metabolic health is so critical, is that it allows for us to say, okay, what what are the ways to achieve metabolic health? And I think we need more of our colleagues, even though we're more keto and carnivore oriented, who speak that language of, listen, there's multiple ways to get there. And everybody is different. Bio individuality is real. 
And I just love the fact that you're expressing and came unto the forefront with that message. I think that'll allow us to hear each other. And maybe I, I think about Vinnie Tortorich and how, uh, you know, he couldn't get anybody on the other side of the aisle, on the vegan side, the vegetarian, to come to his uh, new documentary, Beyond Impossible. But we should be able to have these conversations. You know, I do something on uh, uh, Facebook every Monday night with uh, Dr. Terry Mason, who was, who's been in uh, forks over knives, et cetera. He's very much a vegan advocate, but yet we can have a, a dialogue with each other. We can talk. And, and to be honest with you, both approaches can work. So I think that's really important. I want to say that because I think uh, if we're going to make progress, we have to think that way. So uh, another principle you shared is sleep. And, and, and I can tell you, I'm doing a little bit of an experiment right now with coffee. And I love coffee. I think there's no problem with coffee, but I just wanted to see, you know, how about if I just go without coffee, but make sure I get enough sleep, right? And what I'm finding is for the most part, I don't eat coffee. And I do like the warm taste of, I like the taste, I like the smell, I like all of that, but man, so when I'm, so, but, but, but sleep is so critical. And a lot of times we underestimate it. So talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts on how important it is to get enough sleep. Yeah. So, you know, in the book, I talk about exactly that, getting enough sleep uh, and getting enough quality sleep specifically. So, you know, I don't say you need to sleep eight hours a day or nine hours a day or seven hours a day. You need to get enough quality sleep so that you feel rested, you know, and you're not tired as you go throughout the day. And one of the interesting things we find is, you know, it's a bit of a feedback loop because if you're not metabolically healthy, you sleep worse. Um, and what I find is when patients get metabolically healthy, when they do these things to start improving their metabolic health, it helps them to sleep better. Mm -hmm. uh, and sleeping better, I think, is is a key principle, not sleeping more. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there are plenty of people who sleep a lot. Uh, they sleep, you know, nine or 10 hours at night, and then they sleep throughout the day because they're tired all the time but they're never getting quality sleep. So right. it's not, you know, getting them what they need. And what I've personally found is as I've gotten metabolically healthy, I actually need less total sleep. You know, I'm fine sleeping six hours a night oftentimes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I know I'm getting more quality time during that shorter period of time. Uh, and I think that's what's important. So, you know, in the book, I basically say, you know, the principle is to sleep enough and get enough quality sleep, uh, to support your metabolic health. Yeah, that's definitely the key. And and that's why, again, going back to bio-individuality, uh, there's no uh, recipe for sleep that's perfect. You look at studies and it'll say, well, somewhere between six to eight hours is where the morbidity and mortality is the least. But, you know, where on that spectrum do you fit? And, and there are probably people who can get five and a half hours or, you know, that do just fine. So I remember when I was... Uh, uh, learning about uh, people who eat raw food. And some of the people I learned from, they say, oh yeah, I don't, I don't have to sleep that much since I've been doing this raw food diet. I'm like, really? So, so it's a lot of, a lot of things about metabolic health that will help all aspects of your life and how you remove waste from your body. Uh, how do you, you know, process and metabolize different hormones? All those things become more efficient. So I think that's really important. And and, and, and the last thing I want to point to in terms of a principle, and you have others, uh, is this idea of stress. I think about you. I remember when I was um, in my, um, my residency at, at a hospital called West Suburban in Oak Park, Illinois, uh, right outside of Chicago. And man, the surgeons, they would come in uh, very early and sometimes they would leave very late. Uh, they had long cases. I remember rotating through surgery. So it just seemed stressful. And now you're you're trying to change the world by uh, teaching the message of metabolic health, which means you got to have podcast interviews. You, you're continuing to do your work, and it seems stressful. So, talk a little bit about the importance of reducing stress and and how are you managing that yourself? Yeah, exactly. And again, you know, in the book, I talk about you know needing to manage your stress, and realistically, we can't eliminate stress. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a stressful world and we all have stress within our lives, uh, but you need to find some outlet, something that helps you manage the stress. And, you know, that's different things for different people. Some people like to meditate. 
Uh, some people turn to religion uh, and spirituality. You know, some people it's just family and friends and, you know, good quality community. And, you know, in the end, whatever works for you, you know, is great. You just need to find some way to deal with the stress so that you're not, you know, feeling that stress all the time. And yeah, as you mentioned, you know, I have a very busy life um, and I get into very stressful situations, you know, in the operating room and outside Mm -hmm. the operating room. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, I find ways to deal with that. And again, you know, similar similar to what we talked about with sleep, what I have found is as I got metabolically healthy, I was better able to deal with that stress. I just felt less stressed less often. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I didn't have that stress in my life anymore of, you know, I'm always hungry. What am I going to eat? You know, worrying about that if I was doing a long case. Uh, So that's one less stress in my life these days is is what to, you know, what to eat. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, this is a consistent finding, you know, many of the physicians we interact with in the low carb space have talked about this, that when people get metabolically healthy, a lot of their stress, Mm -hmm. mental health issues, all of these seem to improve as well. Yeah, I'm finding it's just uh, my perception of stress has changed. And and I think that's partly because, like you said, you're kind of more level. So when you're faced with stress or stressful situations, you just, you think better. Even as I was coming home and I looked in front of me and I saw a wall of traffic. So I said, oh my God, is there an accident? Am I going to make it in time for the recording? But because I'm level, I was like, well, let me first go to Google and do a Google map. Maybe it'll redirect me. Uh, And then I noticed that, oh, it's just a little bit of a a short amount of traffic that's tight, and then it's going to pick back up. But, But I think when I'm not level, you kind of panic. You, you, you make something bigger than it really is. And, and I think that is so cool to be able to come home. When I finish with the recording, um, then I'll spend time with my uh, father-in-law who has dementia. And then, and then I'll be thinking about dinner. I think my son's going to cook tonight, but I'll be thinking. Of, but, but all the things, my wife will come home. And then, but I'll still be present because I'm level. And so no matter what, I, I got to study this weekend because I'm in school, So, I'll be, but I'm not freaking out about any of this stuff. You just kind of bite the elephant one bite at a time. And, and, and I just never imagined that eating differently would do all of those things. So, and then there's other things, other responsibilities. And one of them is I chair the outreach committee. I think you're part of the, uh, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Yes. And we love them and what they're trying to do. So shout out to Doug Reynolds and Pam Devine for the work they're doing with the society. And and they're really trying to do what we're doing, which is spread this healing message of metabolic health. And but many docs are still not aware and you know, and because of that, it's important that we have voices. But you know, but but if you're talking to a patient who is not in your area, they can't see you, they can't see me. You know, what advice would you give them so that they can find a doc who uh, maybe has a little bit more expertise in this area? Yeah. So, you know, um, the the first thing I tell people around that is, you know, find the people who have achieved what you want to achieve around your health Mm. and find out who they work with, Mm. you know, similar to other uh you know areas of our life you know recommendations and networking is, is very powerful and mm-hmm. you know if we're looking for a uh, an accountant for instance you know one of the first things we're going to do is go ask our friends who seem to be in a good shape financially you know mm-hmm. who they work with mm-hmm. uh, so i think that's very powerful and then you know because the, of the internet you know that becomes a lot easier because you can find communities of people online who are having success uh, and go to them the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, like you mentioned, has a has a directory of physicians nationwide uh, that are doing this. Um, and then, you know, I do have a telemedicine practice, and I actually, you know, am now licensed in over thirty states, mm. uh, and I see people, you know, from all over the country via telemedicine. And I know there are other physicians, you know, that are doing the same mm-hmm. thing. So, um, you know, ultimately. Um, It is important to find a physician who is, you know, at least aligned 
or tolerant of these yeah. ideas. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, there are a lot of physicians who still, uh, you know, will, uh, you know, kind of berate patients if they're trying to do these types of things. And they have the, the old, you know, misconceptions about, you know, this being unhealthy. Uh, you know, ultimately, your physician should at least be working with you, mm -hmm. uh, not against you. And uh, one of the things I do go through in the book is some questions that you can ask your physician, you know, to kind of figure out if they're, you know, on the same team as you. Uh, the other important concept for people, though, is to realize that you are in charge of your health. Mm. You know, it is not up to your physician to make you healthy. Hopefully they're going to support you in that. But it is your responsibility uh, you can't rely on your physician. You can't rely on the healthcare system. You can't rely on the government uh, to make you healthy. You have to want to do it for yourself. You have to seek out those habits that are going to make you healthy. And that's actually what we both did. I had a irritable bowel, bowel problem. I, I and of course I'm a physician, but I had to kind of do my own thing to figure it out. Uh, nobody was really telling me to do the things I now do to achieve metabolic health. And obviously you were able to lose a substantial, another human being you lost and that person disappeared and now you have your new version of yourself. So, but I do agree with you. We, we have to kind of control our destiny. And, and when you're not getting answers, you have to ask more questions. If you're not sure you need to research things and, 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 and just try to find a solution. And then you partner with somebody who's willing to at least walk with you. And even though they may not even know all the things you're learning, but if they're able to say, you know what, you know, hey, I'll, I'll walk with you and I'll help you do research and, and we'll walk together. And then and, and you may bless a whole lot of folk because the average doctor is going to have 2,500 patients, right? So so if that doctor and or advanced practice clinician then is, you know, going to find this new way of doing things, then all of those other patients are going to benefit. So you may be doing them a favor. It's all about how you talk to them. And I appreciate you having those questions. So when people get your book, they'll be able to use that as a tool. Um, another thing that's interesting, uh, you know, is, you know, when do we worry about this? And, 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 and I think about the patients, even if I think about people who are close to me, uh, the two men who are uh, pretty close to me would be my father-in-law, stepdad, both in their 50s when heart disease uh, kind of snuck up on them. And uh, so the question becomes, you know, is there an age uh, that the listeners should be thinking about when they should really be thinking about getting evaluated for metabolic health? Uh, or is it, you know, from, you know, is there a starting point that they should uh, start worrying about? Yeah. So, you know, I tell people it's never too early to start, you know, focusing on your metabolic health. And it's also never too late to start focusing on your metabolic health. Uh, no matter where you are, you know, even if you have uh, heart disease or advanced, you know, other medical problems, um, it's never too late to start improving it by focusing on your metabolic health. You know, for most people, uh, I would say, you know, late 30s, early 40s is when, you know, metabolic problems start showing up. Uh, but the reality is, is that, you know, the earlier you start looking for it, mm -hmm. um, the better. Mm -hmm. And the earlier you detect that you're kind of headed down the wrong path, uh, the better. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I think is very unfortunate in our medical system is, you know, we know that a decade or more before Patients show up with high blood pressure, diabetes, um, you know, certainly heart disease, that if we're looking at the right things, we can detect that they are on that path, yeah. that they are not metabolically healthy and that they're headed down that path. And, uh, you know, simple tests like a fasting insulin level, mm -hmm. or again, just looking at the triglycerides and the HDL on the cholesterol panel will tell you, you know, way before the actual diseases start showing up. And I think that that is one of the important things we need to refocus on in healthcare and start looking at these predictive measures much earlier so that we can head off the problems and start making the changes earlier before the damage occurs. And I, I, I think about the irony of um, 
the idea that sometimes the insulin level may or may not be covered, um, how we're trained to focus on LDL and total cholesterol when you don't even have those on the metabolic, you know, that wasn't one of the things you mentioned as a way to predict metabolic disease. Um, so it's really important that we start to change our health system to one where we do measure waist circumferences, where we make sure insulin levels are not only covered, but that clinicians know that you can predict diabetes five, 10 years in advance by doing an insulin level. And it's a simple concept. It's a, it's a, if, you're, if, you're, if your pancreas has eyeless cells that are working, they're going to rev it up if you have too much uh, starchy or sugary food or maybe excessive grains. It's going to rev up that pancreas with the idea, I'm going to keep that because it, sugar can be very toxic at high levels. So your body's going to try really hard to keep those levels where they should be. And, and maybe the sign that that's happening is not your blood sugar level because it's keeping it okay. Instead, it's this fact that your insulin level is so high. And so that's how it's predictive and it's such a good test, yet it's not a test that's ordered often. I wonder how many people listening to this episode have ever had an insulin level. Something that could predict five to 10 years in advance that you're going to become diabetic. Just thinking about that just blows my mind. And I just think that we have to do better. And, and speaking of where we learn and uh, grow as physicians, you go to medical conferences um, and you are hearing the messages that they're sharing. So are you starting to see any shifts in the education, uh, in the messaging that would suggest that they are learning some of these principles or is it still, you know, are we still years away from that? Yeah, I think we still have a long way to go. You know, there have been some some glimmers of hope. You know, as you know, the uh, you know now past president of the American Diabetes Association, uh, you know, talked a lot about metabolic health and low carb mm -hmm. diets as a way to uh, you know address diabetes. Uh, and we have you know low carb medical conferences that are going on. Uh, you know, as you mentioned before. Uh, Doug Reynolds and Pam Devine and, and their organization, uh, you know, put on those conferences. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to be talking at one next week uh, as we're recording this. Uh, but, um, you know, so and, and one of the things that gives me hope is when I go to those conferences, I see more and more physicians there and I see physicians from lots of different specialties there. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when I first went to my first one about three years ago, and, you know, everyone was kind of amazed what's a heart surgeon doing, you know, at this <laughs> conference. Uh, and now, you know, we really do see, uh, you know, all of the different specialties representative. We, you know, we have psychiatrists and, and psychologists there and we have, you know, cardiologists and heart surgeons and we have the family doctors and the, the nephrologists and, you know, the endocrinologists. And I think there are more and more physicians that are catching on to this. Um, I don't think it has quite reached the level of the societies yet. You know, when you look at the American Heart Association, uh, you know, you, you don't see them talking about these concepts yet, but it's going to get there. I think it is a grassroots effort, you know, patients and physicians working together. Uh, I am optimistic that we can regain control of the healthcare system and redirect it, you know, towards keeping people healthy rather than just managing their illness. And I, I do want to uh, make sure um, that anybody that wants to actually hear uh, the previous CEO of the ADA, her name was uh, uh, is Tracy Brown. And uh, she actually, I remember, because uh, I was on the Fasting Lane podcast as a guest, right? And um, she was also on the Fasting Lane podcast. So if you search... Uh, Tracy Brown and Fasting Lane podcast, you can actually hear the interview where she celebrated uh, her ability to get off of insulin using a low carb diet, as well as all her medicines at the time of the recording, she was down to metformin. And, uh, and that was a, a, a powerful message coming from somebody who led such a critical organization. So I'm really excited that that um, happened. And, uh, and, and I guess as we uh, move towards the next thought, um, I wanted to ask you a question about your book, just so 
people who are listening can level set and and know what they would get if they purchased your book. So talk about the lessons that you share and teach in your book so people kind of know what what they're going to be getting. Yeah. So, you know, the first part of the book, we kind of go through, you know, the basics of what is metabolic health, um, how do we measure it, you know, some of the things we've been talking about. And then, um, you know, the next section talks about uh, some of the myths that persist in medicine these days and in, you know, our society these days uh, that, um, you know, quite frankly, go against people being metabolically healthy. And I go through those myths and I talk about, you know, how they came to be, why, you know, both patients and physicians, you know, still believe these things, uh, even though, you know, we have plenty of evidence to, uh, to uh, counteract them. And then, you know, I talk about the principles of metabolic health. Uh, you know, we've mentioned a few of them, but I lay out seven principles of metabolic health that are going to be the framework for people to use to improve their metabolic health. And then in the final section of the book, you know, I get into the kind of the nitty gritty, you know, what should you be eating to improve your metabolic health? And uh, again, I go through many of the popular diets uh, that are out there today, the vegan and the carnivore diet and lots of things in between. And I point out what's metabolically healthy about each one and what may not be metabolically healthy about each one. And the important thing that I think, you know, makes my book a little different than most that are out there is I don't give you the Dr. Ovedia diet plan. Mm -hmm. I don't give you the 28 day plan. I want you to have a framework to find what's ultimately going to work for you uh, with the focus being metabolic health and keeping yourself metabolically healthy. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that resonates with people. I hope people find it useful. Uh, you know, so far it's, I've been very pleased with the, the feedback and the reviews on it. And uh, I encourage people to uh, check it out. Again, it's called Stay Off My Operating Table and it's available widely on Amazon and all the other major online platforms. It's an audiobook format, you know, ebook, Kindle format, and uh, both uh, hardcover and paperback. Uh, formats are available. All right. Well, we definitely want to keep Dr. Avedia healthy. So uh, as we kind of wrap up our conversation, um, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to do to protect your nest. And uh, rather it's focused on nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, recovering from trauma, thinking positively, or if we go to the rope, uh, making sure your positive relationships serve you, avoiding organisms and pollutants that can harm you. You'll, you'll be doing that when you speak and be safe while you're at the conference, I'm sure. And then, of course, uh, you know, protecting your emotions and your life experiences. So when you think about 2022, as we start our new year, where, where do you want to focus your attention personally? Yeah. So, you know, I, I would say my focus for 2022 is really, you know, on building those relationships And, uh, you know, of course, the personal relationships, my family, all that, uh, you know, is very important. But uh, what I'm looking to do in the healthcare community is build those relationships that are going to allow us to get this message out there, get this message to more of the people that need to hear it, the patients who I don't want to end up on my operating table. And so one of my focuses is, you know, building out those relationships and connecting with, you know, more people like yourself uh, who already, you know, are in tune with this, but also connecting with the people who haven't heard this information, the physicians who don't get to hear this information and uh, trying to spread this as as far and wide as possible. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, you're a breath of fresh air. I, I realized that when I wrote my Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes book, uh, I needed to redo my book cover. And when I saw your book cover, I said, it needs to look like that <laughs> with a lot of protein. And it was inspiring. So if, if my book cover changes soon, you'll be one of the reasons why. And But I do want to thank you for your inspiration and just being on the forefront in your particular specialty, especially. Uh, as we help to heal people uh, from metabolic dysfunction. So any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, just, uh, you know, my my final thought, again, is to encourage people, you know, I want to give people hope. 
I want them to know that you can be healthy. You can get yourself healthy if you are if you are unhealthy already, and uh, just encourage everyone to take back control of their health, and you know keep keep searching for the answers. If you are told there's no other option, if you are told there's no way to get healthy, keep asking questions, keep pushing, and keep searching out uh, the resources that you need uh, because we can be healthy. Excellent. Well, thank you. And I do want to announce uh, as we wrap up that uh, the doctor has agreed to join me on uh, Your Health Network, uh, the podcast entitled Can We Talk? And we're going to share uh, a few of his uh, myths about uh, metabolic health uh, that we need to know. And I think there's 12 in your book, and we'll probably touch on four or five, but I think that'll be something that we'll share in the show notes as well. So thank you again, Doc, for being here. And I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Tony. It's been fun. Absolutely. So today, guys, we got permission from a heart surgeon uh, that it's okay to eat meat. Uh, and But more importantly, you don't have to be obsessed with low carb or carnivore like myself and uh, my guests. Just eat whole foods, right? So if you eat real food, uh, you'll probably be on your way to metabolic health. But I'm, but I'm particularly happy that my surgical colleague is leading the way so that others in his specialty will be inspired to do the same. And I only ask that as you learn these principles to make sure you share them with others. The doc gets it, I get it, and I think the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners get it. So let's all work together and, and, and ensure that our friends and family are healthy. So, so as we... Uh, you know, well, last thing I'll say is just make a pledge for 2022 that this is your year. This is your year to change. This is the year to make things happen. And and I'll wrap up with that. So so until we have another opportunity to learn another healthy le- lesson, be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest. <laughs>